Well, thanks for that introduction, and uh, it's great to be here again at State of the Net, um, and special thanks to Tim Lorden for inviting me, and, uh, and congratulations on the exciting program you've put together again this year. I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about two items on the agenda real quick that stand out for me personally. First is the, the excellent cybersecurity panel that is going to be uh, featuring NTIA's own Evelyn Romali later today, as well as the discussion between Rob McDowell and my former boss, Chairman Greg Walden. So both things I'm looking forward to seeing later in the day. For my time, I'd like to lay out some of NTIA's early international policy priorities in the new administration. We plan to be aggressive in advocating for U.S. interests and values in our engagement across the globe at ICANN, the ITU, and in other fora. I'd also like to discuss the Department of Commerce's cybersecurity work, including our efforts to improve the security of Internet of Things and 5G networks, and the administration's plan to counter the threat of botnets. The Internet has become what it is today in part because of a long-standing bipartisan consensus around the principle of multi-stakeholder policymaking and standards development, the idea that all stakeholders should participate in an open and transparent decision-making process. We must continue to fight for this principle, principle and for an Internet that is open, interoperable, and governed through collaboration between all stakeholders. Right now, NTIA has two priorities internationally. The first is the preservation of the Who Is service, which has become one of NTIA's most pressing issues related to ICANN over the last several months. If you don't know much about the Who Is service, it's an incredibly valuable tool for governments, businesses, intellectual property rights holders, and individual Internet users around the world. Put simply, who is is a service that provides easily accessible information about the entities that purchase and manage domain names. This information is often the starting point for law enforcement agencies when investigating malicious online activity and for private sector and government actors seeking to protect critical systems from dangerous cyber attacks, which are growing more frequent all the time. I mentioned our work on botnets. We know that those on the front lines of botnet mitigation rely on who is to do their work effectively. Who is information is also valuable for combating infringement and misuse of intellectual property and for savvy internet consumers looking to ensure that the website they're using is legitimate. It's a simple service, but it's the cornerstone of trust and accountability on the internet. Those of you who participate in ICAD know that Who is has been under constant review and the subject of debate for years. However, its essential character has not changed much since its inception in the early 80s. This is for good reason. Its utility remains critically important to those who rely upon it. But over the last few months, this service's essential character has been threatened. In response to the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, ICANN initiated a process to assess how this rule could affect who is, given that it includes limited personal information about users who registered internet domains. Here are the facts. The text of GDPR balances the interests of cybersecurity, law enforcement, and consumer protection, and many European officials have noted that only limited changes to who is would be necessary to achieve GDPR compliance. Still, there are some who are trying to take advantage of the situation by arguing that we should erect barriers to the quickly and easily accessible who is information. Some have even argued that the service must go dark and become a relic of the Internet's history. Today, I'd like to be clear. The who is service can and should retain its essential character while complying with national privacy laws, including the GDPR. It's in the interest of all Internet stakeholders that it does, and for anyone here in the U.S. who may be persuaded by arguments calling for drastic change, please know that the U.S. government expects this information to continue to be made available through the WHOIS service. Our second priority area is making preparations for the ITU's treaty-making conference, the Plenipotentiary, or Plenipot as we all love to call it, which is scheduled for this October. I believe the United States needs to press for change in the ITU including establishing effective membership oversight of the ITU's finances. This is particularly important given that the United States is currently one of the two largest donors to the Union, and we need to fight against the continued efforts to aggressively move the ITU beyond its limited mandate and into Internet-related and cybersecurity matters. We need an ITU that can effectively and efficiently perform its vital functions in the area of radio communications, and one that fosters rather than hinders pro-competitive policies for telecom, particularly in developing countries. As many of you know, the ITU has five elected positions, Director General, Deputy Director General, and the directors of the three bureaus of the union. I'm pleased to reiterate NTIA's strong support for the candidacy of Doreen Bogdan Martin as director of the ITU Telecommunications Development Bureau. The D sector, as it is generally known, is part of the ITU that brings connectivity to parts of the world that have yet to realize the economic and societal benefits that many of us take for granted. Ms. Bogdan Martin is a former NTIA official, 
a veteran of the ITU's process, and I am certain that Doreen would make an outstanding director of the D sector. Going forward, NTIA remains committed to working with the international internet community. In particular, there are four areas we think are especially important. The first is the free flow of information. Second is the multi-stakeholder approach to internet governance. Third is privacy and security. And fourth is emerging technology. The free flow of information online is a bedrock American principle. And access to information and freedom of exp expression are basic human rights. Still, governments around the world are increasingly blocking access to websites and content, curtailing online freedoms, or even shutting down the internet entirely. In other cases, governments are imposing top-down, heavy-handed intergovernmental regulation of the internet. In the past few years, we've seen court rulings that have forced American companies to remove information that would have been considered protected speech in the United States. These sorts of restrictions threaten economic growth and the societal and educational benefits of the internet, and they must be opposed. The second focus area, how can NTIA continue to support and promote the multi-stakeholder approach to internet governance? What in addition to GDPR should NP NTIA's priorities be within ICANN? Are there any other domain name system related activities NTIA should pursue? These are the kinds of questions we want to hear from our stakeholders on. We plan to also continue our longstanding engagement in the Internet Governance Forum at the United Nations, the premier global forum of multi-stakeholder dialogue on cross-cutting internet policy issues. But there's always room for improvement. We'll seek input on the opportunities and challenges that the IGF faces, how we can raise national awareness about the IGF and its contributions to internet governance globally, and we want to know what we can do to help lower barriers to participation. Third, we want to know how to leverage NTIA's resources to better shore up cybersecurity and online privacy. I'll speak more about the Commerce Department's current cybersecurity work in a moment, but I hope the community will weigh in on what we're doing and help us identify areas where the department can be even more impactful. Finally, NTIA, as part of the department, always seeks input on the department's work on emerging technologies. Commerce has led the US government when it comes to new and emerging technologies, but that leadership requires continued engagement from American industry and from all of you. In order to ensure that American entrepreneurs are able to take risks and find global markets for their digital products and services, we need to make sure we are charting the right path. On such issues as artificial intelligence, blockchain, and 5G, we're looking for industry to help us make the right choices as a government. As I noted, cybersecurity is a key priority for the Department of Commerce and for the administration. As many of you know, last May, the president issued an executive order on strengthening the cybersecurity of federal networks and critical infrastructure. Among other items, the order sought to promote action against botnets and other automated distributed threats. Botnet attacks can be extremely damaging, and they put the broader internet at risk, as well as its users. The Department of Commerce and the Department of Homeland Security were asked to identify actions that could be taken by stakeholders, recognizing that we cannot solve this problem through government regulation. Earlier this month, the departments issued a draft report on enhancing resilience against botnets. We relied on an open and transparent process to generate the ideas in the report, and I want to thank those of you who participated. The report outlines a positive vision for the future, as well as five complementary goals that would improve the resilience of the internet. It also suggests supporting activities to be undertaken by both government and private sector actors. Botnet attacks are a global problem. No single government or sector can solve it in isolation. Really, any solution will require the entire ecosystem acting in concert. But we aren't starting from scratch. There are effective tools available today that can mitigate these threats, but they're not widely used. Changing this will require more education and awareness, as well as an alignment of market incentives that will find a sweet spot between security and convenience. Behind the scenes, there was a lot of collaboration between various government agencies as this report was being drafted. Combined with essential input from the private sector, we now know that there's a common understanding about what we need to do and where we need to go to make this positive future a reality. If you haven't already, I encourage you to read the report and please provide feedback. You can find the request for comments on our website. There will also be a workshop hosted by the Department of Commerce next month at NIST's National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and Commerce will incorporate all the comments we receive into the report before delivering it to the President in May. As a side note, I'd just like to express how proud I am of the work of everybody at NTIA on this report. Um, it really was an effort that took a lot of doing by folks across all different agencies, and as, uh, as the one who's now getting to see the fruits of their labor uh, as the administrator, I'm incredibly proud of the hard work that they've done uh, in outreach and putting together a quality product. 
In a parallel effort, Commerce has been working to foster a more secure Internet of Things environment. Late last year, stakeholders in one of NTIA's open multi-stakeholder processes de developed a series of documents on IoT security and patching. Some great products came out of that process, including a high-level specification of the components of an IoT security update and suggestions for how manufacturers can communicate patchability to consumers. We'll continue to engage with the IoT and security communities to promote the principles and the ideas in those documents. This year, we'll be working on software component transparency with a particular eye toward third-party components used in IoT devices. Most modern software, as all of you know, is not written completely from scratch, but includes existing components, modules, and libraries from the open source and commercial software world. Products are being developed quickly, and in a dynamic IT marketplace, it can be a challenge to track the use of all of those separate components. The growth of the internet makes this challenge all the more difficult. In addition to the increased number of devices, more traditional vendors are assuming the role of software developers to add smart features or connectivity to existing products. While the majority of libraries and components do not have known vulnerabilities, some do. And the sheer, quality, excuse me, the sheer quantity of software means that products will ship with vulnerabilities or out-of-date components. Transparency can be a very important tool here. It can reward vendors that demonstrate a secure development process and help defenders understand how to respond and prioritize during an incident. After all, you can't protect what you don't know about. Finally, with respect to 5G, last year the president made it clear that 5G network security is a critical element of our national security. With the proliferation of devices that the Internet of Things will, is bringing, security in both the device and the network itself will be important to ensuring not only our national leadership in wireless, but also to ensuring access to a vital part of our national economy. NTIA will continue to work with our colleagues across the federal government to coordinate a national strategy on spectrum access, and will work with the private sector to ensure that the standards process for 5G continues to promote our national interests in security. Today's conference is a good opportunity to reflect on what issues matter to you most. Everyone here today has perspectives that can enrich the work that NTIA is doing, and we urge you to reach out to the NTI staff who will be here throughout the day uh, and have conversations about the things you think we should be working on. We want to hear from you, we want to know what you think is important, and we want to be able to help the industry continue to thrive. Thanks for your time. Good morning. My name is Rachel Dacaw. 